So today we're going to talk about how we assess for renal and urological problems. So we're going to be talking first about what the kidneys do, and it's really helpful to understand the role of the kidneys so that we can better understand you know, what can go wrong and what we need to assess for. So, you know, most people, when they think of the kidneys, they think of it being a filter, and that is a very important role that it takes. The kidney does filter out waste. It also helps to um, filter out electrolytes and manage the fluid in the body. Um, so, you know, when there's too much fluid, the kidneys help to get rid of that. And when there's not enough fluid, you know, the kidneys are secreting things to help you to hold on to more fluid. Um, and that's also how they regulate blood pressure. So if you remember that wonderful, fun acronym RAS, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, um, that is how the kidneys help to regulate blood pressure. So they secrete um, these hormones, and these hormones help to uh, create kind of a catalyst in the body that creates reactions which will help you to hold on to more fluid um, and more sodium, which will therefore help you to, as a whole, increase your blood pressure. Um, the kidneys are also responsible for um, activating vitamin D, um, which helps you to absorb calcium, which is really important for bone health. Um, the kidneys work to uh, keep your acid base balance. If you remember, they're kind of the turtle in the system where they help to secrete bicarbonate, which helps to neutralize acid. Um, again, the fluid and electrolyte balance, but you know, especially your electrolytes like potassium, sodium, and calcium are going to be three of the big electrolytes that are maintained by your kidneys. Um, and then um, also your kidneys are responsible for uh, secreting a hormone known as EPO or erythropoietin, um, and that's what tells your bone marrow, hey, it's time to make more red blood cells. So effectively, you know, if you're not doing that, you can have some problems with anemia and things like that. And this is really just the beginning. The kidneys do so much, but it's helpful to kind of know some of the major functions that they do before we get started. So what are the parts of the renal and urological system? So of course there's the kidneys, they're your, you know, of course, renal powerhouse. Um, they do all the things we mentioned above, the fluid and electrolyte, acid base, blood, uh, blood pressure management, waste management. Um, then you have, the rest is a lot of storage and tubes. So you have your ureters, you have one for each kidney. Um, and then you have one bladder, which stores your urine. Um, and then your urethra, which is the tube that goes to the outside of your body to actually um, get rid of all of those waste products and fluid that your kidneys um, got rid of. So when we're working with a patient with renal and urological problems, we're going to want to ask them some really key questions. So we want to start by maybe asking them about some medical conditions they may have related to their kidney problems. So these would include um, hypertension, liver disease, heart disease, diabetes, and autoimmune disorders. Um, so the big ones there are going to be the um, hypertension and diabetes. Those are the two most common causes of kidney problems. So if a patient has these, this could kind of tell you that they would be at risk for getting kidney problems. Um, additionally, any sort of heart cardiovascular disease as well. And a lot of this all comes down to it's about blood vessels. Um, the kidneys are a very selfish organ and they want all the blood flow. And so anything that compromises that blood flow or puts them at risk for not getting that blood flow can get them to the point where they're not going to function the way they should. Um, there's also a lot of medications that can affect the kidneys. There's diuretics, antibiotics, ACE inhibitors, and NSAIDs, just to name a few. Um, and all these medications are what the, they call nephrotoxic or um, can cause some sort of damage to the kidneys. So if a patient's on these, we want to keep in mind that it may be just from the medication itself that they're having that damage. Um, and then we want to look at maybe some kidney symptoms that they're having. Um, have they had a change in their weight or their appetite, excessive thirst, fluid retention, uh, itching, fatigue? Those are some common symptoms. Um, but that medical history will be really important. We also want to get a good urinary history, so knowing about how their voiding is going. So we want to ask them questions like, how do you go to the bathroom? Do you need to use any special device to go to the bathroom? How often do you go? What color is your urine? Is there any odor? You know, how often are you going? Um, uh, when you're going, you know, is it different at all throughout the day? Um, are you awakened in the middle of the night to urinate? When you're going, um, is there any difficulty or pain? Um, 
Uh, are you going really frequently? Do you feel that sudden urge like I have to go right now? Or are you having any incontinence? Um, any blood in your urine? So after we get through the questions, then we want to move on to start assessing. And of course, with assessment, we always start with inspection because we always have to look first. So the places we're going to assess a kidney patient, we're going to start with their skin. Um, and from waste buildup, they can have changes to their um, skin, such as having kind of a yellow or a gray color to their skin. They also can have rough, dry skin from all those wastes coming out. Effectively, um, the body, when it can't get rid of the waste through the kidneys, it's going to start literally trying to get them out any way possible, and that includes through the skin. Um, we also want to look in the peripheral extremities. We're going to look for edema and weight gain um, because the kidneys are responsible for that fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Um, and so uh, when the fluid's not able to get, uh, you know, released through the kidneys, then they're going to start retaining fluid in other areas of their body. Uh, we may uh, inspect their abdomen, looking for masses or distension. Um, and then we also want to assess, you know, and uh, when we're talking to them, kind of seeing their general, like, level of consciousness, their fatigue. You know, I was talking about how those are really common symptoms you're going to see with a patient with kidney problems. So there's also lines, tubes, and drains that we'll need to assess for. Um, so those may, may include some sort of urinary diversion, like in the upper left-hand corner is a urostomy, um, which is just an outside external pouch to collect urine instead of um, going out naturally through the urethra. Um, there's also Foley catheters, which can be seen in the lower left-hand corner. Um, patients may have surgical drains from kidney procedures or surgeries, such as JP drains, that, that's the one that's in the middle. Um, and they may also, depending on the procedures they have, require some sort of bladder irrigation, which is displayed on that right-hand side. There's a few different types of Foley catheters um, and um, other types of catheters in general. Um, and so normally a patient is going to have a straight tip catheter, but you can see on the left hand side there's kind of this curved catheter. That's what's known as a Coudet catheter. And those are usually used in older patients with prostate issues um, or patients that have abnormal anatomy. Um, so usually it's going to be male patients, but they can be used in females. Um, but that curved tip just helps to get around the prostate or other obstructions. Um, that catheter in the center is what's known as a three-way catheter, and you can see there's that extra port on the end, um, which allows for irrigation. Um, and last but not least, on the right-hand side is a intermittent catheter or a straight catheter, and what that is for is for a patient who doesn't need a catheter in all the time, but maybe is having some urinary retention. So we can insert it, drain their bladder, and then pull it back out. And we usually do that every four to six hours just to keep their um, bladder from uh, staying full all the time. So where do we palpate? So the kidneys are located in the back of the abdomen. So we can't palpate them on the front of a person because the um, rib cage is covering where the kidneys are. So we're going to feel on the retroperitoneum for the kidneys. Um, one of the other places we're going to feel in the genitourinary system is going to be in the bladder. And normally the bladder should not be palpable. It's only palpable when it's full. So if you're palpating their lower abdomen over that pubic bone and you feel their bladder, that is considered an abnormal finding. Because um, generally, um, by the time that that bladder is palpable, um, they should be urinating by then. We can also percuss and auscultate. Um, if the bladder is full, it will sound dull upon percussion. Um, we can also percuss the kidneys to access for what's known as CVA tenderness or the punch sign. So you can see like in this picture, you put your hand on that uh, retroperitoneal area and then you take your fist and you kind of, um, you know, hit your fist into your other hand. And if doing that causes tenderness, it can be a sign that there may be a kidney infection or kidney stones. Um, we can't auscultate the kidneys. I don't think we would hear anything, but we can auscultate the bowel sounds. And a lot of times if there's a problem with the kidneys or in the abdomen in general, um, it's going to be shown through those bowel sounds. So we can uh, listen to those. So here's some funny urinary system words. We can talk about, you know, what abnormal is. So there's anuria, which is no urine. Usually this is going to be a patient who is in complete um, renal failure and di on dialysis or even having a really bad acute kidney injury where they're making no urine. 
Uh, there's also dysuria, which is painful or difficult urination. That can sometimes be seen when there's infection um, or other um, urinary issues such as like BPH and things like that. Um, there's hematuria, uh, which is blood in the urine. And um, usually this is just seen with urinary tract infections or if there's some sort of trauma going on. Um, nocturia and hesitancy, both of those um, are associated with BPH, where nocturia is that frequent urination at night, and hesitancy is that difficulty or delay in initiating or starting the stream of urination. So both of those are usually associated with that benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Um, and then there's oliguria, which is diminished urine, less than average, so less than that 30 mils per hour. Um, and this is usually seen in a patient who has some sort of kidney injury or kidney failure. So a lot of the assessment is in the urine um, when we're assessing a kid, uh, kidney or uh, renal patient. Um, and so uh, we want to know how much, you know, how much urine um, are they making? And then also what color is it? Um, so we do a lot of measures. Like previously mentioned, we really want to keep about 30 milliliters per hour on average. It may differ a little bit by weight, but uh, most people should be making at least that much. Um, and the color can tell us a lot about what's going on with the patient. So urine does come in many, many colors. It can be red, a uh, dark smoky color, which usually indicates some sort of hematuria. Um, if it's yellow, brown, or olive green, it could be too much bilirubin. Um, an orange red or orange brown can happen with certain medications. Um, uh, cloudy usually indicates there's some sort of infection going on. Um, and if it's colorless, then it can be, you know, indicative that there's too, the patient's drinking too much water um, or they could have some sort of kidney disease or diabetes insipidus, which you'll learn about later this semester. So there's a variety of urine tests that can be done. Um, the most common one you might see done is a urinalysis, and that's going to tell you what is in your urine. Is there infection? Is there particles that are not supposed to be there? Um, you can also get a creatinine clearance, which can really tell you how well that you're clearing creatinine, which is going to tell us how well the kidney is functioning. Um, a culture may be done if we uh, think there's infection present to see exactly what that infection is that's growing. Um, and you can also get a 24-hour urine collection, which tells you specifically for a certain component how much is in the urine over 24 hours. Um, so, for example, they could check, you know, how much glucose is in the urine over a 24-hour period. And the reason that we like to do that is sometimes getting a one-time specimen is not going to be as accurate to tell you how much you have of a specific component versus getting it over 24 hours. Because some stuff may only be in your urine for certain periods of time. So by getting it over 24 hours, you're getting a more accurate picture if you have too much of something in your urine. So let's look a little bit more into what's in a urinalysis. Uh, it's very important to first look at color because like we said, color can tell us so much about what's going on in the urine, whether there's something going on in another body system or how hydrated the patient is, um, but it really can tell us a lot. So we want to look at that color. We also want to consider odor because if there's an abnormal odor, it could be sign of infection or other problems. Um, as a whole, the kidneys um, do not filter out a lot of protein into the urine. They hold on to a lot of protein. So if proteins are being let go into the urine, it can be a sign of kidney failure um, or a problem with that filtering system in the kidneys um, because they usually do not let go of protein. Um, if there's glucose or ketones present, that can be a sign of diabetes or a problem with diabetes. Um, just as with bilirubin, um, this can be a sign that there's a problem in your um, bile system or in your gallbladder. Uh, we also look at specific gravity and osmolality, which effectively tells us how concentrated the urine is. It tells us how many particles are present. Um, which can be really helpful in trying to determine if there's dehydration or other medical conditions present. Uh, we always monitor the pH to keep a certain balance in order to um, prevent infection in the urinary tract. Um, red blood cells can be present for a variety of reasons, including you know, maybe the kidneys aren't filtering well, maybe there's some sort of trauma, um, or again, you know, sometimes you can have blood in the urine from a urinary tract infection. Um, white blood cells would be a sign of infection. 
Um, and then CAS. So CAS are actually a like particles of kidney tissue um, that's let go into the uh, through the urine. And so if those are present, that's usually a sign of some sort of kidney damage. So um, and some sort of maybe going towards kidney failure. So if CAS are present, it's literally pieces of kidney tissue. And so that would be more of a red flag, like something's not right um, going on with the kidneys. So there's also blood tests that can be done to check how well the kidneys are functioning or filtering. Um, and all of these are um, a little bit different in their reliability. So like for example, the BUN, it tells you how well your kidneys are functioning, but it's not as reliable because it also can indicate dehydration um, or other medical conditions that aren't related to the kidneys. Um, there's the creatinine, which is more reliable, and it's one of the most common ways that we do measure kidney function, but it's not necessarily the most reliable because it can take a while to um, increase, and it can stay increased for a while even as things are improving. So there's also the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, um, and this is actually calculated from a combination of taking the creatinine, but also taking into account age, race, and sex, and this is considered one of the more accurate or most accurate ways to measure kidney function. Um, and then potassium says... Uh, if potassium is not being filtered, it's usually one of the first electrolytes to become abnormal. So that's usually a good indicator of how well that filtering process is going on in the kidneys. Now, there's other reasons that the potassium can be elevated, but in combination with an elevated BUN creatinine and um, decreased GFR, then um, it usually can be a sign that there's definitely something going on with the kidneys. So there's a variety of diagnostic tests that can be done on the kidneys as well. This includes like CT, ultrasound, and MRI, which allow us to really like visualize those outside structures of the kidneys and see if there's any sort of obvious deformity or um, uh, you know trauma or other issue to that area. There's also what's known as an IVP or intravenous pilogram where we can really look to see if there's any sort of obstruction. You're using the dye like you can see here in this picture to look for um, any sort of issues um, by lighting up the structures of the kidneys. Um, there's cystoscopy where we can go inside and look inside some of those tubes and structures for issues and then a biopsy to um, really see if there's any sort of damaged tissue to the kidneys. So that's all I've got for today. I hope this helped.